The Successful Aging in Your Brain program is an educational resource. It does not endorse or recommend any commercial products, processes, or services. It is not the intention of the Successful Aging in Your Brain program to provide specific medical advice, but rather to provide users with information to better understand their health and urges you to consult with a qualified healthcare provider before making any changes to your lifestyle. We'll start with getting to know your brain, a brief introduction on how the brain is put together and normally functions, with an emphasis on learning, memory, and some of the changes that accompany healthy aging. Then we'll look more closely at your brain as you age, focusing on Alzheimer's disease, stroke, traumatic brain injury, and depression. And finally, we'll look at the four factors of a brain-healthy lifestyle. The things, in other words, that people who maintain good cognitive function into their later years tend to do, according to research. Recently, Successful Aging in Your Brain was presented live with a panel of brain science experts, and we'll be hearing from them during the course of our discussion. Thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you. is way to my left. He is the neurology chair and neurologist in chief at Wild Cornell Medicine. Um, Dr. Wendy Suzuki is professor of natural science and psychology in the Center for Neural Science at New York University. And she's right here in the middle and she's also fabulous. And Dr. Scott Small, yes, give her a round of applause. Dr. Scott Small is Professor of Neurology, Division of Aging and Dementia, and he's Director of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at the Taub Institute for Research on Alzheimer's Disease and the Aging Brain at Columbia University. So you have real, absolute experts. I am not, so I'm gonna be learning just like you. So why don't we start with you, Dr. Fink, just sort of telling about yourself and an overview of this really important topic. We, we are in, an age, what I like to call the golden age of brain science. When I started in this field over 30 years ago, we struggled to diagnose conditions and we had great difficulty in diagnosing them. We rarely had a, a treatment. Now, today, the field has completely changed. Uh, we have developed truly amazing therapies for a whole variety of brain disorders, many of them which are disorders that occur in people as they get older. Uh, so let me put this in perspective for all of you. The five most common serious brain disorders in the United States, more than five million people have had a stroke, more than five million people have Alzheimer's disease, more than three million people have had a serious traumatic brain injury. More than two and a half million people have epilepsy. And more than one million people have Parkinson's disease. Those are the five most common serious brain disorders in the United States. And guess what? All five of those increase in prevalence as we all get older, all of them. And you're probably thinking, well, what about traumatic brain injury? Isn't that what football players get and bicycle uh, riders who don't wear helmets? It turns out the most common cause of a severe brain trauma is a slip and fall. Slips and falls are the more common than sports injuries or, or anything else. So it turns out that who is subject to slips and falls those of us who are getting older. So the five most common serious brain disorders all increase in frequency as we get older. The good news about this story, and I'll use stroke as an example because it's an area that I've spent most of my career working with. With current knowledge, without having to do additional research with current knowledge that we have and current treatments that we have, we can prevent 80% of all the strokes that occur. We can prevent 80%. And hopefully we'll get to talk about some of that. Uh, so 
all of the things we're going to talk about today really do affect uh, the aging population. And the last thing I want to say before we turn this over to others is that our brain is the only one any of us are ever going to have. <laughs> Every other major life-sustaining organ can be transplanted. Hearts, livers, kidneys, lungs, not the brain. <laughs> the brain you have is the only one you're ever going to have, so let's take really good care of it. We all want to take good care of our brains. Let's learn more about how they work and how to care for them. The brain weighs a mere three pounds and is small enough to hold in our hands, but it is our body's most vital organ, and like all body organs, depends on its blood supply for food and oxygen, which means a healthy heart and healthy arteries are vital for brain health. The brain's complex network of nearly 100 billion nerve cells, or neurons, orchestrates our every thought, perception, and action. It also guides and controls essential functions of which we are unaware like breathing, heart rate, and hormone output. More than anything else, our brain defines who and what we are. Electrical and chemical signals travel through a vast network of neurons. Every experience represents a pattern of such signals. Different parts of the brain are devoted to specific functions like vision, emotion, and judgment. But most experiences are complex and activate circuits linking widely distributed areas of the brain. An experience, particularly if it is repeated, may change the brain in a lasting way, enhancing the efficiency of the circuit that processed it. In this way, events and actions become memories and learning occurs. In old and young alike, the brain is constantly updating itself to keep pace with the changing world, adding facts and refining skills. Like other organs, the brain changes in the course of normal aging at a rate that varies from person to person, and so does the way it functions. How memory changes with age is the object of much scientific study, but it's important to keep in mind that memory is a part of a broader range of the brain's capabilities or cognitive functions, which include attention, the use of language, abstract thinking, decision-making, goal-setting, planning, and judgment. One of the key questions that we've been grappling with um, is the distinction between age-related memory decline, which we all experience, sometimes called cognitive aging, versus Alzheimer's disease. Um, for the longest time, it was thought that they were one and the same. Um, as you might know, Alzheimer's is a disease that has a very long percolation period. It takes us a long time to detect it. It starts in the hippocampus, a structure you've heard about, a structure involved with memory. Um, and so it was a plausible assumption that was uh, pretty much the dominant one around 10, 15 years ago that the subtle changes in cognition and memory we all experience might be the earliest stages of Alzheimer's. Um, and what we have done, we've, we, we had reasons to suspect that normal age-related memory loss and Alzheimer's were subtly different, but fundamentally different in terms of mechanism and how you might intervene. Uh, and deploying some of the techniques that Matt mentioned, uh, these new uh, sophisticated uh, tools that we're blessed with in current neuroscience, we've been able to really show very clearly uh, that although they target neighboring areas of the brain, Alzheimer's and, and, and normal aging are really distinct. And then we show that their molecular causes, the actual drivers of Alzheimer's and aging are separate. Uh, and that's, that, that's really led us into separate pathways of how we can intervene in one uh, versus the other. The other thing I would say, I think, which was important for normal cognitive aging is that sometimes, because I'm a doctor and I, I see patients with Alzheimer's, and I also see a lot of people with just normal memory decline. Um, it's almost a societal question, perhaps an ethics question to medicine. Should we be engaged uh, in developing interventions for a normal process, normal age-related memory loss? There's no question that Alzheimer's is much more devastating. It's a, it's, it's, it's a devastating disorder. It requires most of our attention. However, as all of us are living longer, uh, as uh, all of us want to stay engaged in cognitively complex lifestyles, even subtle memory decline that, that occurs by aging 
is impactful. And in fact, the FDA now has approved this as an indication for drug discovery. The World Health Organization, just in case you think it's a concern of us here in, in, our, in, in our very wealthy first world country, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a global uh, epidemic. So uh, I think both are important to Alzheimer's and aging, uh, and that's what we focus on. We as scientists should also always be careful not to oversell. I, I think what we're talking about here is really cutting edge insight uh, and the flip of cutting edge means controversy and debate within you know, uh, conferences. But I think there is a unifying um, convergence of understanding that Alzheimer's and aging are different. The hippocampus has different regions, but one in particular that is affected by aging is also the very region, studies show, that can generate new neurons and that benefits most from physical activity. I, th I think maybe one one helpful um, uh, uh, perspective is to talk about how we, and certainly in my lab, how we approach problems. I mean, how do you understand, diagnose, ultimately treat anything within the brain? Uh, and one answer is understand what region is most affected. Once you can identify a region, and there are probably uh, upward of 300 different regions in the brain, there are probably 10 regions in the hippocampus. If you can pinpoint what region is affected, sort of the logic of, 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 any, uh, of many fields, you can then use that uh, as a tractable way to understand uh, uh, diagnosis and intervention. So for example, if the dentate gyrus region in the hippocampus is affected by aging, then we could start asking what are ways, what are things that affect this area? One is exercise. Another thing that actually Wendy and I published on together uh, are some derivatives of cocoa beans, not chocolate, <laughs> cocoa beans called flavanols. Uh, and that's another uh, topic, if you want, we can talk about, and that's dietary interventions, lifestyles in general. Uh, so that's just a perspective uh, on aging versus Alzheimer's and how we approach the problem. So the signs of cognitive aging and the signs of memory-related diseases, like Alzheimer's, are separate and distinct. Scientists now know that the brain is remarkably plastic and that it continues to change throughout life. The wiring up of our brain begins in the third week of gestation and continues at breakneck speed through the first months of life. A baby's brain sponges up information from its environment and sprouts billions of new nerve cell connections, called synapses, eventually pruning some back to strengthen the synapses we need and get rid of those we don't. A second round of dramatic synapse growth happens during adolescence, followed by another round of pruning. Until recently, scientists believed it was all downhill from there. But we now know that relatively few neurons die in a healthy brain, and that the birth of new brain cells, called neurogenesis, can occur well into old age. Among the areas where neurogenesis may be important is the just-mentioned hippocampus. This discovery supports the observation that the brain never stops fine-tuning itself in response to new learning and novel experiences. Indeed, a healthy old brain can learn as well as a young one, although it may need more time and focused attention to do so. It also underlines the importance of lifelong learning. Every time you learn something new or do things in a new way, connections among the brain cells thicken, making it stronger. Mental lapses like forgetting names or where we park the car are common even among the young, but we tend to pay more attention to them as we get older though, worrying that they represent the first sign of failing mental powers. For example, names, proper nouns, and rarely recalled words are usually the first to go, and just a slight decline in working memory makes it noticeably harder to multitask. Procedural memory, or how to do things, however, stands firmer against the toll of time, especially for skills we've practiced so long they seem second nature to us, like driving a car. But forgetting is a normal and possibly an important part of aging. Let's not forget that forgetfulness is normal. Uh, we, we tend to use the robot or the computer as our, uh, as our ideal model. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen movies or read books or just imagined what a curse it would be uh, to have no forgetfulness. It's, it's, it's natural, it's, it's inborn. I am not advocating uh, not to take all these measures to prevent a decline from memory, but I do sense that there's a societal obsession with memory. Um, I often lately have given uh, lectures and even organized a symposia on forgetfulness. Uh, 
uh, think what a forgetful pill, not a memory pill, how successful a forgetful pill would be to, to soldiers coming back with PTSD. Uh, the, the, the more comic version of that, think of uh, how a um, marital therapist would benefit from uh, giving forgetful pills to patients. So for, forgetting is not necessarily bad, it's inborn. When it, when it changes or when it's a disease, we should, we should target it, but we should not try to be um, our laptop computers. And That's the comedy aspect. That's what <laughs> and, we talked about. And let me add one more piece of good news to what Scott said, because no one has really said this yet. There are some cognitive functions that get better as you get older, that actually get better. Wisdom. And those things are our ability to make decisions gets better, and our ability to understand complex problems gets better as we get older. So you can have some short-term memory loss as you get older, but still be much better at making important decisions about things uh, than you were when you were younger. So getting older is not necessarily a decline. Certain things get better. So forgetting isn't always a bad thing, and there are some simple ways to improve your memory. Dr. Suzuki explains how repetition, novelty, association, and emotion can help us remember the information we want to retain. I mean, just in terms of memory, everybody's always interested in how you improve your memory. And from a neuroscientist who studied memory for the last 25 years, um, there's four keys that people should realize. The first one is obvious, repetition lets you remember things. That, that just works, we know the neural basis of that, it strengthens the connections that are, that are forming as you, as you um, uh, develop memories. The second is novelty. The brain is focused on new things. This is why we tend to, mem uh, to remember new, surprising things better than old things. The third is association. If you want to remember something, associate it with other things that you're already familiar with. Maybe a new person knows somebody that you, that, that you already have in your long-term memory. Make that link and it'll make the memory last longer. And the fourth one is one that we're all familiar with, which is emotional resonance. If it's, if it's emotional, sad or happy or specifically funny, it tends to be remembered more because you get involvement of the emotional centers that tend to uh, strengthen those memories. So repetition, novelty, association, and emotional resonance are four key things that everybody can use to help improve their memory. You add yeah, let me, I want to just add one more thing, which is to uh, not develop extreme anxiety about some loss of short-term memory as you get older because there is what we refer to as normal aging, and normal aging tells us from large studies that from the age of 30 up until the 80s, there is a slight but gradual loss of short-term memory in normal healthy people who are not developing Alzheimer's disease. So we all develop some loss of short-term memory as we get older, so don't Freak out over it if it happens. If you're concerned, you can see your doctor to be evaluated, um, but, but that doesn't mean you're developing a disease or you're getting sick. And then I'd just like to reinforce what Dr. Suzuki said about learning something new, a novel uh, experience. Uh, do something you've never done before. Learn to play an instrument, learn, learn a new language, take a course in a college, learn something new that challenges you that's going to be difficult. The fact that it's difficult is what is good for your brain to be stimulated. When we think of memory problems in dementia, we think of Alzheimer's disease. But not all dementia is due to Alzheimer's. Dementia is an umbrella term to describe conditions that impair intellectual and social functioning severely enough to interfere with daily activities. Alzheimer's disease is probably the most common form, but recent studies indicate that vascular dementia, a type caused by restricted blood flow to the brain, is also a growing problem. Some experts believe vascular dementia accounts for as much as one-third of all dementia, and mixed dementia, Alzheimer's disease plus vascular disease, another third. Alzheimer's and vascular dementia share a number of risk factors. Controlling these risk factors could significantly reduce their incidence, experts say. What research has 
taught us over the last 20 years is that many of the factors which cause a stroke also play a role in the development of Alzheimer's disease. And for a long time, there was debate about this, and I guess there still is some debate about this, uh, but we know from good long-term studies of aging populations that if you can reduce or eliminate the causes for a stroke, and let me tell you what the major ones are. The first is good treatment of high blood pressure, stop smoking, have a good diet, lower your cholesterol, identify if you have any underlying heart disease, particularly a heart rhythm problem known as atrial fibrillation, physical exercise. All of these so-called risk factors can lead to a stroke. And it turns out that by reducing or eliminating those factors, you can reduce your risk of having a stroke. You can also reduce your risk of having a heart attack, which now the heart really exists just to pump blood to the brain. We realize that. Uh, that's its major function. Uh, but by eliminating these risk factors, there's good evidence that you can delay the onset of developing dementia, probably Alzheimer's disease, by several years. You can delay it by maintaining these very good health habits. And um, I agree a thousand percent with what Dr. Suzuki said. When I give my own patient's advice, I tell them the single most important thing you can do for your overall health as you get older is to increase your physical exercise. It has incredible benefits both for your physical health, mental health, brain health, memory, prevention of stroke, delay of Alzheimer's disease. And these are not things that I'm just saying because I like them or believe them they have been borne out by research in the field. Uh, a lot more needs to be done, particularly to find specific ways to treat Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and that's where a tremendous amount of research and effort is going on right now. And we really need more help and support uh, to continue that. We'll talk more about how and why exercise works as part of a brain healthy lifestyle soon. But first, let's talk more about dementia. You will remember that Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. A hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is the accumulation of abnormal proteins, called amyloid and tau, that block both the communication between brain cells and oxygen and nutrient flow within them. The diagnosis is only definitive on autopsy and is based on the extent of amyloid and tau in the brain. Alzheimer's disease involves other changes as well, including disrupted glucose metabolism and inflammation in the brain. Research is very active in these areas. Although drugs can temporarily improve symptoms by increasing communication between brain cells, the search for one that can truly delay, prevent, or reverse Alzheimer's disease have thus far been unsuccessful. One brain scientist has called Alzheimer's far and away the most complex disease to confront the human nervous system. But again, not all dementia is Alzheimer's disease. Anything that interferes with the brain's rich supply of oxygen and nutrients from the bloodstream can injure its cells and disrupt brain function. Vascular dementia, the second most common form of dementia, can reflect the sudden dramatic effects of a stroke. But more often, the damage is gradual, caused by small, even microscopic blockages of brain blood vessels. While the symptoms may be similar to Alzheimer's, they often involve difficulties with reasoning, planning, mental flexibility, and decision-making, rather than memory. A stroke occurs when blood flow to the brain is interrupted enough to threaten serious damage or even survival. But strokes are 80% preventable. Though certain risk factors, including heredity, age, and race, can't be changed, several can be changed, treated, or controlled. Risk factors like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, smoking, and atrial fibrillation, which is a heart rhythm disturbance. 
Strokes are twice as common in blacks as in whites, in part due to higher rates of hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. Because its symptoms are also sometimes so similar, it is often misdiagnosed as dementia, depression deserves some special attention. About one American in five suffers from depression at some time during their lives. In particular, one to five percent of those 65 and older living independently are significantly depressed. And half the time, this is their first experience with the condition. Depression is a real disease caused by changes in brain chemicals called neurotransmitters. Besides the suffering it causes, depression raises vulnerability to other brain diseases. Let me make a comment about, uh, about the depression Parkinson's. I have uh, a great personal history with Parkinson's disease. Uh, my father had Parkinson's disease. His sister, my aunt, had Parkinson's disease. And my father-in-law had the worst form of Parkinson's disease called uh, Lewy body disease, and he died very quickly from that condition. So I, I live with this condition. I actually worry about my children inheriting genes from both sides of the family uh, as, a, as a concern whether they're going to develop it. And I guess I have to worry about myself, whether I'm going to get it or not. Um, but the other part is, and I'll contrast my father and my aunt. My father had severe motor problems. He was shaking, he was stiff, he was losing his balance. But it never bothered him in the least. He kept up with his life, he was active, he went out, he did whatever he wanted to do. I remember when he had trouble walking, he would grab a shopping cart and walk with the shopping cart. Didn't phase him ever. His sister, my aunt... I do that at Fairway. At Fairway, <laughs> yes. It, his sister, my aunt, had actually mild motor problems. She could walk around and do pretty well, but she became profoundly depressed. Profoundly depressed and upset to the point that she could not leave the house at all. I mean, and she was much more debilitated from her depression than my father was from his shaking and falling over. It turns out that the same chemical in the brain which is deficient, something called dopamine, when it is deficient in the motor tracts of the brain, it causes the severe motor problems. When it's deficient in other areas, the frontal lobes of the brain, it causes severe depression. So depression is part of Parkinson's disease, but it varies from person to person, but they go together, and they're caused by a similar deficiencies of a similar chemical. Um, so, so, and depression obviously goes far beyond Parkinson's disease. Um, the World Health Organization has identified it as the second most serious disabling problem in the world is depression. It is essential to recognize the symptoms of depression and get effective treatment. We all feel blue occasionally and heartache and grief are part of being human, but low moods that persist and interfere with life could mean depression. The signs and symptoms of depression may include prolonged sadness, lack of enjoyment from one's pleasurable activities, significant changes in appetite and sleep patterns, loss of energy, persistent sluggishness, irritability, anger, worry, agitation or anxiety, recurring thoughts of death or suicide, feelings of guilt, worthlessness or hopelessness, inability to concentrate or make decisions, withdrawal from social contacts, and unexplained aches and pains. Depression often runs in families, suggesting a genetic basis. Environmental factors like stress at work, loss of a loved one, or relationship problems may trigger depression if you're susceptible. Antidepressants are an effective treatment for most people, and certain types of psychotherapy can be equally effective. Combining drugs and therapy work better than either one alone, and exercise and light exposure therapy may often be as effective as drugs for less severe depression. Maintaining supportive relationships with others and avoiding isolation may help you avoid becoming depressed. As will reducing stress, practicing good sleep hygiene, and pursuing your interests, as well as exercise and physical activity. Exercise and physical activity may also help you avoid falls and their resulting injuries. According to the Center for Disease Control, 
falls are the leading cause of injuries and deaths from injury among older Americans, and often signal the end of independence for the individual. You know, when, when it comes to, to traumatic, uh, the way that trauma could affect the brain, one is physical, the other is also emotional. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, there, there's obviously a, an epidemic, sadly, uh, in 20-year-olds uh, because of all the wars uh, we've been engaged in. Um, and uh, they, are, they could be treated differently, and they probably will. You talked about prevention. I think Matt, Matt alluded to this uh, uh, subtly that, you know, <laughs> wear helmets. I, I, I will admit that when I took up snowboarding five years ago, I refused to until I concussed myself, and it was very embarrassing going to the Columbia ER saying, I'm, I'm a neurologist here, and I wasn't wearing... Not wearing a helmet. <laughs> I was not shame. wearing a helmet. Shame on me and shame on anyone who doesn't. Um, but that doesn't prevent, of course, the kind of injury that can happen um, in, in, in your home or, or, or and so, uh, but, but there are some commonsensical things. I think what's really more interesting now is this, uh, again, we shouldn't oversell this debate about chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, which is made famous through the NFL and the NFL's resistance to acknowledge it and they finally had, have last week. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to um, the press, actually. There's still a debate about what that is. Is it very different? How does it interlink with Alzheimer's, depression, uh, uh, Parkinson's? But there's no doubt, there's absolutely no doubt that it's a real and separate entity. Uh, and so I think this is really at the cusp of, uh, of biomedical research. I would maintain, maybe Wendy will say exercise will cure that also. I, I will say that I don't think that, that we have cures for, uh, for traumatic brain injury that are the, the real dramatic ones. Uh, and the one, the PTSD is also uh, an epidemic and one that I, I think uh, research in the next five years will make headway into. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's a really important issue. And, and I, I mean, my, my lens, of course, as you all know, is through, through exercise and one of the, uh, kind of uh, themes in exercise today is exercise for your life. Um, exercise uh, uh, to help prevent falls, to make you more flexible, to make you more able to deal with, you know, all of the potholes in the, not potholes in the sidewalk, but the uh, um, uneven sidewalk and, and uneven uh, surfaces that we have to um, deal with. And that that's one easy way to kind of link link the two is the more that you do work out and, and get yourself more nimble uh, and fit you don't have to do the football exercises that they do but but you know there's lots of gym exercises that you can do um, to address that. our first study looking at a clinical population was in a population of um, patients with traumatic brain injury and we brought to them uh, eight weeks twice a week exercise and this form of exercise uh, it was very engaging it was very fun it combines physical movements with positive spoken affirmations and they all loved it um, but these were traumatic brain injury people that had survived for at least um, that this was happening at least a year year and a half after their injury and the clear effect that we found was just eight weeks twice a week exercise this was for an hour twice a week um, increased four different measures of quality of life um, um, mood, and uh, it was, uh, it seemed like an easy finding to see. So how can we benefit from all this information? Based on an extensive review of animal research and population studies, a 2015 report by the Institute of Medicine recommended that people take these steps to slow cognitive aging and preserve mental function. They are. Be physically active and exercise regularly. Reduce cardiovascular risk factors, including hypertension, diabetes, and smoking. Discuss with your doctor medical conditions and drugs that may affect brain function. And keep your brain lively to promote brain health with social engagement, intellectual activity, and adequate sleep. And because brain aging is a lifelong process, it's never too early or too late to put this advice in practice, although it becomes particularly important in the later years. One clinical trial enrolling more than 1,000 people in their 60s and 70s found 25% better performance in tests of memory and other thinking abilities among those who followed a brain-healthy lifestyle. 
So I think a major question that everybody's interested in, I don't care how old you are, whether you're a man or a woman, what ethnicity you are, everybody wants to know how to make your brain stronger. And I came at this as a neuroscientist from the, the kind of basic science perspective. I studied with a woman at UC Berkeley who was the first one in the 1960s to really show us exactly how much the brain can change in response to the environment. And what she did is she asked, what would happen if you put a rat in what she called an enriched environment with lots of toys, lots of other rats to play with? Think of it like the Disney world of rat cages. <laughs> and she compared the brains of those rats to rats that were raised in what she called an impoverished environment with no toys and no other rats to, uh, to play with. What she found was the brains of the rats in Disney World, the outer covering was actually thicker. The brain grew parts of the brain that were important for motor function and visual function. Those are the parts that grew. The uh, structure critical for memory called the hippocampus, a structure I've studied for the last 25 years, also increased in size because we now know that new brain cells were born because of all of that stimulation. So I think my, my one take home message for you is that we know from years of neuroscience research exactly how much we can change the brain. We're starting to understand exactly how we can improve the brain with something as simple as what we learned from those first, first experiments. What was it about Disney World that made the brain change so much? It turns out that the single factor that caused the majority of those brain changes was physical aerobic exercise. I'm not talking about, you don't have to become a triathlete. You, you have to increase your physical aerobic exercise. And let me give you one key reason why. Physical aerobic exercise stimulates the birth of brand new brain cells in your one major structure. You actually have two. Your two major structures that are critical for long-term memory. That structure, the hippocampus, that I mentioned. So just by increasing your aerobic exercise, and for some of us who haven't been active, just going for a walk can start that process going can um, increase the birth of those new brain cells and really strengthen that structure. So a lot of my research has focused on um, uh, uh, trying to understand exactly how that happens. Many people ask me, what is the minimum amount of exercise I really need to do to get this to happen? And I'm very interested in that question. But that's a major message that I want you to take home, that, that we know this from neuroscience research. We are understanding all the things that are changing the brain for the better, some things for the worse. But this one, everybody can do today. You don't need a gym membership. You don't need to buy new suit, shoes. Get up and get your heart working more than you are right now. And that's, get, that's what gets the process going. So physical activity has benefits for all of us, regardless of our age or our current fitness levels. Regular exercise has multiple benefits beyond maintaining brain fitness. There is evidence that it may also reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and vascular dementia. It may improve mood and reduce stress as well as alleviate mild to moderate depression. Regular exercise may reduce the risk of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. It can help control weight, lower blood pressure and cholesterol, slow bone loss, and may protect against breast, uterus, prostate, and colon cancer. And it may also improve sleep and increase energy. But what makes exercise so beneficial? How much of it do we need to do? And what kind of physical activity works best? Exercise is strongly associated with successful brain aging because it increases levels of brain chemicals that encourage the growth of neurons, which seems to enhance memory and learning. It also enlarges blood vessels, so more blood and oxygen flow into the brain and boosts levels of brain-derived nootrophic factor, which is a growth factor that supports and nourishes brain cells. Government guidelines advocate at least two and a half hours weekly of moderate exercise for general good health and five hours for optimal benefits. But any amount of activity helps. Similarly, while evidence is strongest that aerobic activities that raise your heart rate maintain mental abilities, epidemiological data suggests it's not necessary to go to the gym to make a difference. Walking regularly, biking, even gardening and taking the stairs instead of the elevator are beneficial. What's more, exercise works just as well in small doses. Three brisk 10-minute walks, 
provide the same benefits in a more convenient form as a half hour workout. Everyone can enjoy physical activity at little or no cost. All it takes is some initiative. Next, reduce vascular risk factors. We know now that keeping your circulatory system strong not only maintains cognitive function, it may reduce the risk of vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Have your blood pressure and cholesterol checked regularly and take medication if needed to bring them down. If you smoke, stop. Strive to achieve and maintain your healthy weight. Diabetes deserves special mention. Not only does it endanger your heart, it damages the brain directly, accelerating cognitive decline and roughly doubling the risk of dementia. Nearly 30 million Americans suffer from diabetes, often related to being overweight. And again, physical activity is a key factor to maintaining vascular health, and it may also reduce the impact of diabetes. Healthy eating habits are an important part of managing cardiovascular risk. If we're talking about the aging brain, I can envision a time in the near future when we're going to identify specific food substances that are particularly beneficial for the aging brain, just like we have in the previous century for the, comp the, the dietary composition that's particularly important for the developing brain during infancy and, and young childhood. Uh, all parents know that, what to stay away from, what to encourage. Um, and so we, there are a lot of things I hear about, blueberries and things like that, and there's a lot of soft science out there. I don't know if I can advocate anything in particular, but what I know is because the science is becoming hard and, 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 and strict, uh, and because the proof of principle is already out there from our lab and from others, that we could show that there are some dietary products that are particularly benefit, beneficial to the, to the hippocampus, etc. Uh, I can imagine in the near future we'll know uh, a particular diet that's really uh, important to be enriched as we age. Now for the Mediterranean diet... Um, Scott, I think you should tell them more about the flavonoid study the flavonoids. Before, you, before you go on to Mediterranean diet. Okay, so I, I don't know if there are any uh, um, reporters from the New York Times here, but um, I, I have a slight beef with, uh, with the one who covered our story. It's nice to be covered. Uh, it was about uh, flavanols that are derived from cocoa beans uh, that we published a few years ago on showing that it improved age-related memory loss. Uh, and um, I begged the reporter, uh, I was of course delighted that she was covering us, I said, whatever you say, don't say that chocolate's good for the brain. <laughs> I practically begged, and of course on the front page, that, that was practically the title. So, so, you know, chocolate's wonderful, and we could talk about the well-being and the, and the, and the, and the great feeling of, of, of eating chocolate, but I, you know, I didn't want to be the guy, the doctor's going on record saying, eat chocolate, it's good for you. But it, 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 it was the proof of the principle uh, that these flavanols, which are essentially found in apple peels, in uh, grape seeds, in cocoa beans, things that are in our diet that could in fact target this area of the brain that we've talked about that's affected by aging, and in fact we, we, we found a mild improvement in, in age-related memory loss. It's not the definitive study, to recommend it yet. We're actually replicating it now in, larger, uh, uh, in a larger cohort. One needs to always replicate in science and test for, for confounds. But it was a proof of principle that diet, and we talked about lifestyle, exercise, are things that I do believe uh, in the near future will, have, will come up, we, we can imagine uh, a sort of regimen one can recommend. Um, now for the Mediterranean diet, another exemplar of this general principle, um, which really seems to be most beneficial, as Matt was saying earlier, uh, on vascular health. So stroke, heart disease, blood vessels, which relate to stroke, uh, certainly uh, heart disease and indirectly to Alzheimer's disease. We still don't exactly know how it happens, uh, but the Mediterranean diet are things that are really, uh, have been, uh, it's called the Mediterranean diet because it's on the uh, eastern rim of the Mediterranean, so, you know, Greek, Turkish diet, uh, um, fishes, um, beans, uh, oils of, uh, of, of, olive, of olives, etc. For more information about a healthy diet, visit choosemyplate.gov for accurate, free resources about food and nutrition. The third key factor is for you and your healthcare provider to do together. Manage medical conditions and medications. 
Many drugs can impair memory and thinking short term, and sensitivity to side effects generally increases with age. Even drugs you've been using for years may become problematic when you add a new one. Make sure your healthcare provider knows all the drugs you're taking, including non-prescription products and supplements. Reevaluate long-standing prescriptions with your healthcare professional whenever you add a new drug. Ask if they are all still necessary, or can any of the dosages be reduced? Get prompt and effective treatment for medical conditions that may accelerate cognitive aging. These include diabetes, hypertension, over or underactive thyroid, chronic kidney disease, and obesity. Sleep problems can also adversely affect thinking ability and deserve medical treatment. Over-the-counter sleep aids can cause memory problems in their own right and should be avoided. I'm a very practical person and I look at a lot of these problems as public health problems. I do not have a laboratory, I don't do laboratory research, uh, but I look at populations in, in with a way that we call epidemiology and try to understand how things affect large populations. So it turns out that having a poor sleep as you get older, and there are a number of causes for that, uh, is associated with the development of many medical and neurological problems. One of them is Alzheimer's disease. That's one of them, but it, you also can develop an increased uh, death rate from having a heart attack, having a stroke, and many other conditions. So poor sleep is a serious problem. But what I think is actually a more serious problem related to sleep is the indiscriminate use of the, by the general population of sleeping medications. There is no such thing as a safe sleeping pill. Whether you get it as a prescription from your physician or you buy it over the counter in the drugstore, uh, sleeping medications have a whole range of serious side effects and consequences. And there's evidence that people that take one class of sleeping medications called benzodiazepines, which includes things like uh, Dalmane and Clonopin, and, and there are a whole load of, of sleeping medications in that category, uh, can have an acceleration. They can develop dementia earlier. There's also a very common sleeping medication uh, called Ambien, which probably many of you take, which all by itself can cause severe impairment of memory, uh, very severe impairment. Obviously, I'm not being paid by any pharmaceutical company to say any of this stuff. <laughs> so as part of this, you want to get good, healthy sleep, but without taking sleeping pills. And there's something called sleep hygiene, uh, certain ways that you can get healthy sleep um, uh, by structuring when you go to bed at night and when you wake up in the morning and not to leave the television on. Many things that you can do to have good, healthy sleep, but not to rely on sleeping medications. Including exercise. Exercise will definitely help your sleep if you add that into your, into your routine. Adequate sleep is part of the fourth factor of cognitive fitness. Some tips for practicing good sleep hygiene are exercise regularly, but not within a few hours of bedtime. Practice relaxation techniques like deep breathing or meditation before going to bed. Avoid big meals, caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol near bedtime. Keep your bedroom comfortable, neither too hot nor too cold, and avoid reading and conversation in bed. Consider seeking treatment for sleep apnea if necessary. As discussed, avoid over-the-counter sleep medications. Speak to your healthcare provider about all the medications and nutritional supplements you take. The timing of them may impact your sleep. If you don't fall asleep within 20 minutes of going to bed, get up and do something relaxing until you feel tired. Last, keep your brain lively. The strongest evidence for the benefits of mental activity links more years of education with reduced risk of dementia. But there's data suggesting that at any age, learning new things and pursuing activities that stimulate the brain in new ways can strengthen brain cell networks and preserve thinking ability. 
Challenging activities like developing new skills or learning something new appear to maintain memory better than less demanding ones. These things might include reading books that make you think, playing board games that demand concentration, going to lectures on unfamiliar subjects, and learning a new language. Even taking a new route to work or changing how you do ordinarily mindless tasks may help your brain maintain its vitality. Commercial computer-based games and programs designed to improve mental function, sometimes called brain training, may be helpful in this regard, but there is no proof that they work any better than less structured intellectual activities like these. Scientists theorize that engaging your brain in such ways creates a cognitive reserve of stronger, denser nerve cell connections that compensate for age-related changes and may even mitigate the toll of disease. Researchers who have explored these questions by placing animals in enriched environments, as was discussed earlier, have found that more stimulating surroundings accelerate neurogenesis and induce secretion of compounds that support brain cell growth. Again, going back to the early studies looking at those rats in Disney World, uh, the one a major factor in that enriched environment that caused a lot of brain changes were, uh, was the, um, the physical aerobic exercise. But the other thing that they benefited from was the social interaction. Rats, like people, are social animals. And there's an enormous amount of um, um, positive, uh, um, positive things that you get from, or positive effects, positive brain effects, I should say, that you get from social interactions. And um, uh, I, I teach an exercise class at New York University, and I, I specifically choose to teach forms of exercise that actually create a community, because I think that's so important. So I'm getting you know, two aspects of this enriched environment, the exercise and the community building. And that becomes even more important as, as you age, and, and finding friends at venues like this, and people to talk to, and people to stimulate your brain in, in different ways, not only people on the panel, but the people that are next to you, and, and um, having the same questions that you might have. That circles back, actually, to, to depression. One of the, one of the single most um, risk, strongest risk factors for depression, particularly among older individuals, is social isolation. Uh, it's, it's always re remarkable to me how we live in a land of individualism, right? And, and it's always remarkable when people insist on, you know, staying in their home in the suburbs by themselves. Sadly, a spouse might have died, the kids have left, but yet they, you know, they want to, they, 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 they confuse autonomy with, uh, with, 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 with success. And it's, it's remarkable how social isolation is bad for many things. Epidemiological data suggests that having a sense of effectiveness and control over our lives, a feeling that we contribute to our families and or society, and feeling good about ourselves predicts well-preserved mental abilities. Such data also indicate that people with good social networks live longer and are physically healthier than those who are socially isolated. While it takes effort to establish relationships and deepen existing ones, these ideas may help. Get involved in projects that entail regular contact with others. Volunteer your time for a cause in which you believe. Don't overlook animal companionship. Furry and feathered friends can bring great joy and purpose into our lives. Last, consider participating in clinical studies, sometimes called clinical trials. At all of our institutions, we have hundreds, maybe thousands, of clinical trials which are tests of new treatments in patients that have a whole variety of diseases. And that includes strokes and Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, all these brain disorders. Um, and it is difficult to get people to enroll in these studies um, unless they are um, really thinking about others, because if you think about yourself, it's a study which is often what's called placebo control. There's a control group. So half the patients get the active treatment, the other half do not. And patients say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be in the control group. I want to be in the treatment group. Well, the fact is that we do this study because we don't know if the treatment is going to work or not. So. 
if, if we want to make an advance and be able to come up with new treatments that are really going to help, then we all need to participate in these trials, even if you feel that it may not have a direct benefit for yourself. Uh, so I would urge all of you, if uh, you're involved in anything like this, or you have friends or family, to please encourage everyone to participate in this. My personal view is that every patient that comes to see me and my uh, team members, if we don't have a definite treatment for their condition, we want that person to be enrolled in a trial to test something new. It's the same thing we do with patients who have cancer. If we don't have treatment for the cancer, we want you to participate in a trial. That's the only way we're going to make advances to cure all of these awful conditions uh, that we want to get rid of. Dr. Swan, do you want to comment on that also? I actually completely agree, uh, and I would just really second that. And uh, you know, we all come from uh, great institutions just here on the island of Manhattan. Uh, we all have websites where, in our case, it's Alzheimer's and normal aging. We have, I think, upward of 12 or 13 active clinical trials in our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and anyone who walk, walks through our door, we offer it to them because I think um, it's part of a, a, um, a societal understanding of, of how we need to tackle this disorder. We often complain about the NIH or, or funding agencies not providing enough funding and that's part of the problem. Uh, it, the, but it's, on, it's incumbent on all of us to really participate in these studies to, to, to run them, perhaps from our sake, from the funding agencies to fund them, and, uh, and, and the community at large to, to be engaged. I mean, Matt, Matt mentioned uh, cancer. The other good example, I think, was HIV uh, 20 years ago. There was a real community effort, and I think when it comes to these disorders that are really going to sweep as an epidemic as we all age, I think it has to really be a, a call to arms across the board. Clinical studies are medical research projects in which volunteer participants help us understand normal aging or develop new treatments and medications. An observational study is an investigative effort to collect data on health-related participant outcomes. Unlike clinical trials, in observational studies, people are not assigned a specific treatment regimen. Instead, participants receive routine medical care. The trials follow strict rules monitored by the National Institutes of Health and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. For information on participating in clinical trials, go to clinicaltrials.gov. Before we end this panel, I'm going to ask each one of the extraordinary panelists what is the most important fact for us to know about successful aging? Even though you have, we've had this wonderful discussion, is there some one aspect, fact in addition, or just reemphasizing what we have said today? So Dr. Small, we'll start with you. Is there something uh, you want to highlight for this amazing audience? I, I, I actually, I, I agree with Wendy. I think if there's a single factor, uh, I think it's, you know, it's remarkable, we talked about epidemiological studies, and it's so, sometimes frustrating, you know, one day eggs are good, then they're bad, butter is, good, butter is bad, but if you look at any study for any disorder, aging or otherwise, physical exercise is always good. Uh, and so be careful of panaceas and overselling from, from, from panelists, but if there's a single factor that I think uh, is important, I would say physical exercise and, and, and stay socially engaged. Dr. Suzuki? And I'll add on that, of course, that's, that's my point as well, but uh, I want you to realize that one simple bout of physical aerobic exercise can not only improve your mood, but can increase your ability to focus and pay attention. It's like an immediate effect. Everybody wants that. You don't have to be a triathlete. Just get out and exercise, and, and that's really the take-home message. Dr. Fink? So I agree with my colleagues, and I will add uh, what was uh, mentioned earlier review your medications, and get rid of anything you do not really need to take. Just take medicines that you really need and nothing else. Well, I want to thank this phenomenal panel and all of you. We welcome you to stay informed by visiting our website at Dana.org. Thanks for taking an active role in leading a brain-healthy lifestyle.